Welcome back to another online lecture of macroeconomics. In this particular lecture, we're going to be talking about the difference between real GDP and nominal GDP. Nominal GDP and real GDP. So up to this point, when we were introducing economic output and national income accounting, we talked about what is GDP. We talked about the two ways to measure GDP. We talked about the expenditures approach and the income approach. We used all kinds of initials and the expenditures approach. We said GDP equals C plus I plus G plus X. We talked about the importance of measuring economic activity. So, you know, first we measure it, then we compare it, and if possible, we make policy measure changes. Well, in this particular segment, we'll talk about the difference between, we'll define and talk about the difference between nominal, G, nominal GDP and real GDP. And we'll also talk about why real GDP is a much better method of comparing economic output over time. And then we'll look at some methodologies or, or some, some techniques on how do we actually calculate real GDP from nominal GDP. Well, nominal GDP, right, it's GDP repeated, oh, oh, sorry, GDP reported in the prevailing year's price level. All right, so the best way to explain this is it's gross domestic product which has not been adjusted for changes in the price level. On the next slide, and we'll go over this again, it, we talked about this earlier that GDP equals P times Q. In other words, GDP equals the price of all goods and services uh, in, in one year times the quantity of all goods and services in one year. Right? But here's a little problem. Let's say, for instance, that you know, in 2005, GDP was $10 trillion, And in 2006, GDP was $11 trillion. Well, if we were trying to accurately measure how much the economy grew, and you know, we were trying to do it in percentage terms, I'd say, well, it went up by $1 trillion. It was pretty obvious, right? Well, all right, but how much did it grow in percentage terms? Well, you know, the math would be easy, right, if we didn't if we didn't account for one one particular idea. So, if something increases from 10 to 11, right, that's a 10% increase. One over 10 is a 10. But did GDP really grow by 10%? Well, here's the problem: is that over time, prices of goods and services typically go up. Now, there could be a period of deflation. In other words, we could be adjusting nominal GDP to get real GDP. By, by adjusting for deflation. And we'll, we'll explain inflation and deflation in great detail in, in a couple uh, slides from here, actually, you know, after the unemployment lecture. But most of us are familiar with the idea of inflation, the idea that, in general, prices of goods and services goes up over time. So the things cost a little bit more today than they did a year last year, and definitely more than they did five years ago, and, and, and probably a great deal more than they did 10, 10 years ago. And over the last 60 odd years of economic activity in the United States, there's been either some mild inflation and sometimes some rather significant inflation. So we actually haven't had deflation. So real GDP, the definition of real GDP is gross domestic product adjusted for changes in the price level. So in the previous example I just gave you, I said, okay, if 2005 it was $10 trillion worth of, dollars worth of economic output, in 2006 it was $11 trillion worth of economic output, well, how much did prices go up, right? How much did prices add to that increase from 10 to 11 trillion dollars? And here's a very key point. We're really trying to accurately measure the quantity of goods and services, the quantity of goods and services produced, right? So what we do is we come up with this idea of what's called a price index, right? A price index. And what we do is we take a market basket. We say, okay, what, what's the definition of a price index? It's the market basket of a, you know, of, of goods and services produced in a given year compared to that exact same or a highly similar uh, market basket in, in other in other years, right? So when we say a price basket in a specific year, we're going to use this price basket, price market market basket in a specific year. That's what we're going to call the base year, right? That's what we're going to call the base year. All right, so let's look at the next slide. We'll you know, go over these points again, and then we'll look at some examples of how we, we actually use this price index. All right, so here's the actual formula, nominal GDP over the price index in hundreds is how we calculate real GDP. And the good news is we have some numbers on two slides from now where we can actually go over some examples and we'll talk about how and why this is employed. Again, what's real GDP? Here it is. It's inflation adjusted, right? So it's GDP adjusted for changes in the price level. It's GDP adjusted for those increases in prices. Now, I know it says real GDP is inflation adjusted value of, of GDP. But keep in the back of your mind, there could be a period of time, and you know, if you want to ask Japan about this, Japan has actually suffered through bouts of deflation over the past two decades. So real GDP is gross domestic product adjusted for changes in the price level. And when we say changes in the price level, 
typically our change in the price level is that prices go up and when prices in general of goods and services go up we call that inflation right so it allows us to measure output right at constant prices and this idea here I just spoke of GDP equals P times Q the problem with accurately measuring GDP over time is that prices continue to change and that's why we need this price index and we use this price index system to calculate real GDP from from nominal GDP right that's the idea of it right so how do we delete the effects of, of a price changes over time well let's look at an example all right so first I identify what we're measuring here right so on the left hand side we have the years 1968 78 88 98 2005 and 2008 well First of all, obviously one of these is in a, you know, in red, right? So I'm like, I feel like I'm hanging out with my, my little nieces now watching Sesame Street, which one of these things is not like the other. Well, obviously year 2005 is not like the other years. It's in red, and I made it in red for a specific reason. First of all, 2005 is going to be what we call our base year, right? That's our base year, right? So that's the year we're going to use and say, okay, what if all goods and services cost the same in all other years as they did in the base year. So we'll assume that 2005 prices prevailed for all time. That's where we're going to use that as the price index. And we'll use that the, that year as the base year to convert or to, to evaluate or to examine, to figure out nominal GDP, figure out get, how do we get real GDP, right? So identify exactly that in 2005, nominal GDP equaled real GDP. And that will always be true if this is, you know, if, if you're talking about your base year. And notice also that in the base year, the price index is 100, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to explain and calculate and report all other years' economic activity as if prices were the same as they were in 2005. That will be our base year, right? Now, quickly notice before we do any calculations that for all years prior to 2005, the price index is less than 100. And that should make sense to you because things cost less back in time than they did, right, than they did in 2005. And notice the further back we go, the smaller the number gets, right? So you can think of it and go all the way back to 1968, say, in general, in 1968, now this isn't a perfect measure, but things cost about 22% as, the, as they did in, in 2005, right? Notice now we only have one year, but notice that for the years after the base year, 2008, the price index is obviously higher than, than than the base year, in this case 108, right? Well, how do we get real GDP from nominal GDP? The formula is not right in front of us, so I'll, I'll take our time and I'll explain this thoroughly. Let's start with year 1968, right? To get from nominal GDP of $909 billion, because these are in billions of dollars, right? To real GDP, this is what you do. You take, in your calculator, you take 909.8, Divide it by, now here's where you have to be careful. Divide it by 0 0.2201, right? And that will give you real GDP, right? Oftentimes when I get students' homework answers, I get a number that's too small, much, much smaller, right? And they, they, they'll they hand in the homework, and if you look, you know, the answers are obviously down bottom here. They'll hand in an answer, and their answer will be 41.335, right? And there's no way it was only $41 billion, right? What they did was they simply forgot to move the decimal point over in the price index, right? Now, if you're pretty quick with math, I'll go over this once, and I don't want this to become a, you know, a mathematical uh, effort or some type of mathematical exercise, but the other possible method of doing this is simply take 909.8 divided by 22.01 and then times your result by 100, right? That's the exact same math as taking 909.8 and then moving the decimal point over, 0 0.2201, you would come out with the same exact result. So in the, on the previous slide, it showed you the both both ways to use that formula. I think in the days of calculators, it's much easier to just remember you take nominal GDP, divide it by the price index in hundreds, so you move the decimal point two places to the left, and that will give you real GDP, right? So notice for 1968, right, real GDP ends up being 4 trillion 133 billion and change and then that inflating what does that mean well we inflated nominal GDP to get to real GDP in other words that 909 number that 909.8 number that was much smaller that you know 
economic activity was really greater than that if you said, let's talk about the goods and services produced in 1968 as if they cost the same in 2005. So we inflate the nominal number in 1968 to get the real number in, in uh, 1968. Right? And notice that for all years prior to the base year, we will be inflating nominal GDP to get real GDP. Right? Now, I could do every one of these for you, but we'll just randomly pick one more. I'd say 1988, I like, you know, I like that year for a specific reason. To get real GDP from nominal GDP, we do the same thing. We take 5100.40 divided by 0.6698. All right, and we already have our answer down there. It would turn out to be 7,614,000,000.81. And again, we're inflating nominal GDP to get real GDP. All right. And then the year after the base year, in this case 2008, right? Well, real GDP was 14 trillion, 441 billion and change, right? In this case, you take 14, 441.4 divided by, now be careful here, divided by 1.0848, right? So 14, 441.4 divided by 1.0848, and that'll give you your real GDP of. 13 trillion 312 billion and change right so in that case we're deflating so in other words because prices went up between 2005 and 2008 right the economy really didn't grow from 12 trillion 781 billion to 14 14 trillion 441 billion it didn't because some of that increase was caused by the increase in prices so we deflated nominal GDP from 2008 to get our real GDP of of 13 trillion 312 billion. All right, while GDP is an excellent measure of economic activity, unfortunately there are some shortcomings of GDP as a measure. In other words, it's not perfect, right? So we'll bring these up and we'll talk about them. The first one is non-market activities. In other words, there are plenty of productive activities that take place here in the United States which aren't part of any market transactions. Let me give you an example. So for instance, whether you know this year this year, whether it's a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, somebody stays at home and watches the kids. Well, you know, if both parents are working, it's rather costly to have child you know, child care. So child care is, is quite costly and you know, obviously if you pay some uh, you know, company, some some place you take your kids, you know, you take in the ABC kids on the corner, whatever, you know, the, the child care is in your uh, facility is in your neighborhood. Right? That would be a market transaction. But if someone stays home and takes care of the children, right, that's not reported to the government because no one gets paid there. But if you think about it, it's a very productive activity. right? So this is a non-market transaction, non-market activity, so it's not part of it, not counted as part of GDP. Right? Other non-market activities are like improving your own house. So, you, know, you cut your own grass. Obviously, if you pay a local landscaper to cut your grass, that's a market activity that adds to GDP. But if you cut your own grass, Right, it's not. There's no market transaction, so it's it's not counted as gross domestic product. Right. Now, lately, the uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics and the Bureau of Economic Analysis has actually been trying to um, estimate some of these non-market activities, but for now, it's not counted as part of GDP. The second one, added leisure time. Added leisure time. Well, the average work week in 1950s uh, like was something close to you know. 59 hours a week and now now it's something like 39 hours a week so Americans are working far less than they were on average two or three or four decades ago and 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 for the most part incomes have actually increased right now it's difficult to talk about rising income right now and then an increased work hours because in 2012 we suffered through a recession and there's plenty of people who are only working 20 or 30 hours or maybe 35 hours who would want to be working more but simply there's not work to be had so they've been you know told only come in for whatever 30 hours as opposed to 40 hours but in general you know because remember we're talking about in general here there has been a significant decline in the, in the average work week of Americans and then it has added to significant increases in leisure time. All right, the second one, uh, sorry, the third one, improved product quality. All right, when the when computers first came out, I can remember somebody bought me a computer. I really was kind of anti-computer. I didn't know why I, why I needed this electronic box on my desk. I didn't really see the purpose of it. All right, All right, the darn thing. I think the, you know the the CPU, the you know the desktop was something like eighteen hundred dollars, and the, you know the the monitor was another five hundred dollars, and the printer was. $300. All right, so you're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,300 worth of computing power there. 
And that was in, say, I think maybe 1994 or 1995. Now, I can't remember the first year I got a computer. Well, think about it now. You could get a desktop, you know, a, a nice desktop, and no, not the greatest desktop ever, for 400 bucks, and you can get a printer for, you know, $70, $89, right? And you can get a, a beautiful flat screen monitor for another 100 and, you know, 150 bucks. So the the printer, the computer, and the monitor cost way less now in 2012 than they did back in 1994. And they're far better as far as the quality. Heck, if you took a, a brand new spanking computer out of a box from 2004, it wouldn't have the power to run any of the programs today, right? So over time, products pro products improve. And sometimes they, they improve quite handsomely, right? Now, I know like the Slinky is the same toy it's been for the last 30, 40 years. But in general, products improve in quality. And there's no way for us to really add that into our cold, hard number of GDP, right? Now, the next one sounds like fun, right? Sex, drugs, right? rock and roll, like underground economy. But, you know, obviously prostitution and drugs are part of the underground economy. But the Bureau of Economic Ac Analysis is actually much more concerned about perfectly legal activities, right? So they're perfectly legal that simply go unreported. In other words, they're, you know, I, I, I'll paint, you know, your fence in the backyard and, you know, you fix my, my, uh, my kitchen sink so that's a barter system, right? Or if I pay someone cash because I got some discount or, you know, God forbid a restaurant has customers that pay in cash and the restaurant doesn't actually report all of the income they generate from providing lunches and dinners to their customers. So the underground economy is really not, you know, the, the, the fun thing you're thinking of when you first see that. It's simply legal activities that go unreported, and, and they're actually pretty significant sometimes. And we're going to actually talk about how other countries, especially European countries, this is a bigger problem. Right? Now, GDP and the environment. Right? Here's an interesting one. We had the Exxon Valdez spill up in you know in Alaska there uh, several years back, so we spent I, I would guess the mate at least millions maybe even billions of dollars cleaning up that spill. So interestingly enough, all of the money because that's an expenditure cl spent on that service, cleaning up you know the 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 mess that that that, that ship left and the oil all you know all over the Alaskan coastline there, right? That actually added to GDP. So. If we mess up the environment and pay to clean it up, that adds to economic activity, right? But if we 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 don't subtract away, you know, the noise pollution, the air pollution, the the water pollution. So if we have to pay to clean up the environment, that actually increases GDP, right? And we don't subtract out the damage we do to the environment when producing goods and services. All right, composition and distribution of output. All right, so. We said in a previous slide that of all the U.S. economic activity, total GDP, 4% of U.S. output is military output, right? But look at a country like North Korea. It's closer to something like 17% of total output is military output, right? So GDP just measures the market value of final goods and services. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not judging anyone here, but, you know, we could ask questions like, do we produce too many video games? You know, are they... Are they really the best way we can spend our time, right? Are there, you know, do we produce too many alcoholic beverages, right? Heck, I hope we don't go back to, to prohibition, but we know GDP is really again, it's it's just a statistic. It's it's a cold hard number, and it doesn't really tell us like which goods are better for us and which, you know, even like you know food items, right? Now the last one here, non-economic sources of well-being. The Economist every year puts out a GNH gross national happiness, right? Gross national happiness, in other words. Which citizens in which countries are actually happiest? So just because the economy grows, just because economic activity take, takes place, doesn't necessarily mean we're happier than we were, say, you know, the year before or the decade before. All right, here's a global perspective again. We said we, this will be the last slide for this lecture on, on GDP. This is the amount of unreported or underground activity that takes place in selected nations. So. If you look first, you know, obviously we want to pick the United States there. Roughly, right, the, uh, of all the underground activity that takes place in the United States, it's it, it's roughly equal to about whatever six and a half, seven percent of GDP there, right? Maybe maybe closer to eight percent. But look at these other countries: Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Belgium, right, Sweden, Germany, France. 
what do they all have in common? They're, you know, rather large percentages of, of underground activity compared to their GDP is that they're all European countries with much higher tax bases, much higher tax rates. So if you tax people, right, if you tax income, or if you tax corporate, you know, income, if you tax any type of uh, economic activity, incentives matter. Businesses are going to try to find a way, and individuals are going to find a way to avoid paying those taxes, and it's simply to, you know, don't report some economic activity. So, you know, economic decisions definitely have secondary effects.